First, I just want to say, wow. It's been a long time since I've been here in person. And it's just so good to see your faces in reality and not just as television personalities. <laughs> I also want to take a moment of privilege and thank you as a congregation. You may not know it, but you, in your giving to missions, you give to Development Associates International. And as the, one of the co-founders and employees formerly of that agency, I want to thank you personally for all that you do. We're in 80 countries now doing leadership training for Christian leaders. And, then, and you have a hand in all of that. And I'm going to owe Steve Weed a dollar, I think. Uh, though I don't think I've ever gotten the dollars from him. <laughs> but here's an additional extra biblical verse that has not yet made it into the canon. The scripture, the gospel according to Steve Weed. You are a priest and you have a parish. This has been, for me, the most important sentence in the last five years for my understanding, my identity, and my role, and what I can do. We have a limited span of life in which to be a servant to others as a priest and a witness to the reality and value of a life with Jesus Christ. There are no unimportant people. There are no unimportant gifts. And this is a gifted congregation. I cannot believe how gifted we are musically, medically, academically, and, and just people who volunteer to do things. It's wonderful. But our sense of values is often twisted by the culture of our day. There are critically important things to do in our day with our gifts and our circle of influ influence. But too often we dismiss what is simple ordinary, everyday matters or endeavors as insignificant. If we can truly say, all of us, that we value a cup of cold water as much as God does in his kingdom, we can just go to the benediction right now. You've gotten the point. Okay, tell me the difference between a social media influencer and a philosopher. The philosopher needed a degree to be useless. <laughs> now I apologize to both of them because that's really not true in God's kingdom. We tend to rank fields of study or work as running from the best to the worst or the most valuable to the, to the le least valuable. The graduate in science degree asks, why does it work? The graduate with an engineering degree asks, how does it work? The graduate with an accounting degree says, how much does it cost? <laughs> the graduate with a law degree asks, what case law applies to it? The graduate with a sociology degree asks, would you like fries with that? <laughs> now I can make a joke on sociology because I'm a sociologist, okay? <laughs> We laugh, but it, uncovers, it uncovers the not-so-secret price tags we put on different things. If you have assets or abilities, they were given to you by God. Do you have time? Do you have wealth, influence, power? Do you have skills in speaking or teaching? Are you a healthcare worker or a philosopher or a sociologist? Are you a poet, an artist, a lawyer, a statesman, a musician? Whatever your position and whatever your gifts, they are not yours. They are lent to you from on high to be used to the fullest in the various parishes God will give you in your lifetime. I was thinking back through all of the things I did to make money on through my lifetime, and I think it's about 17 different things. What is in your hands? What is in your hands? And what are you doing with it? Do you believe that God can touch it by, by his spirit and make a difference in our world? If we consult the Bible, we find a vast array of things in people's hands, things that God by his spirit has used. In our text on Moses, you remember that? That's the text that caught me, caught my eye a couple of months ago. When he starts out, God asks him, what's in your hand? And he says, a staff. 
But by the time the conversation is ended and Moses is going to go back to Egypt, it's called the staff of God. Did you get that transition? So there are things in our hands that can become the staff of God in our context with the people that are in our influence. But just think of the, of the people in the Bible. Just a quick reminder. Peter, what's in your hands? A fishing net. And Jesus makes him a fisher of men and women. Timothy, oh, I have books for my colleague Paul because he's going to write letters that thousands of years later we'll be listening to and they'll be reshaping our life. In Judges, there's a handicapped man named Ehud who has a withered right hand. He's handicapped, but God uses him to deliver from King Eglon of the Midianites. And then think of Gideon. What do you have? A clay pot and a torch. Samson, a jawbone of a donkey. David's grandmother, Ruth, she is carrying grain from the field to feed her mother-in-law, her, widow, her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi. David, what do you have? Five stones and a sling or a stringed lyre to play beautiful music. Esther, at a time when genocide needed to be stopped, what did she have? A royal crown and a royal robe that she could use. Nehemiah, a wine cup. A wine cup? What use is that? But he had access to the king when Jerusalem was in ruins. Luke tells us the story, I don't know if you remember it, about the wife of Chusa. Chusa was the wealthy manager of Herod's estate. They had lots of money. And you remember what, what uh, Joanna did? She used her money to support Jesus and the Twelve as they were on an itinerant ministry. And then there's the nameless sinful woman who comes to Jesus holding an alabaster jar of perfume. What's in your hands that God by the Spirit can touch and use in your parish? They all had things that God could use. Still, there are other stories where people have things in their hands and they misuse them. Or they came into their hands corruptly. King Saul, you remember, he has that spear. What does he do with it? He doesn't put it down. He throws it intending to kill David because of his envy. Or there's the religious zealot, the man named Saul, who's going to become Paul, holding the cloaks of those stoning Stephen to death. Judas, with 30 pieces of silver coming into his hands. Or Peter, the apostle Peter, with a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane, protecting Jesus and cutting off the ear of the servant of the high priest. What's in your hands? Whatever is within our control and competence in our hands is made must be aligned with God's will and goodness and righteousness and yielded to the Spirit. But I tell you this, even if it is only a cup of cold water, if that is all we have, it is more than enough to do God's will. Now the squeegee. You've been wondering about that. <laughs> this is just a, a, a household pretend one. Not like those professional ones that you see, the people who really do window washing. And in your imagination, I want you to come aboard Elevator 69A in one World Trade Center. It's an express elevator that stops on floors 67 to 74. The time is 847, September 11th. Do you remember where you were on September 11th? And there we meet six men. There's Alex Smith, who works for the Port Authority office, post office. Jan Demser, a Polish immigrant who speaks better Ukrainian than English. He's a window washer with a bucket and a squeegee. Next to him are three Port Authority engineers, highly educated, Colin Richardson, Schwam Eyer, and George Phoenix. And the last onto the elevator at that point was a fellow, a beefy fellow in an expensive suit holding a computer. It was John Patch Pachkowski, a retired Marine colonel, 
an acting director for the whole Port of Authority of New York and New Jersey with 8,000 employees under him. The car begins to rise. But before it reaches the first landing, there's a thud and the building shakes. The elevator swings from side to side like a pendulum and then it plunges. Al Smith hits the emergency button to stop it. And at that moment, 848, One World Trade Center entered its final 100 minutes. No one in that elevator knew the clock was ticking. Of those in the Twin Towers below the floors impacted by the planes, 99% got out, but the elevators were death traps, 206 of them. Only 21 people got alive out of the elevators. At eight minutes into the event, a live voice came over the intercom that said to them there'd been an explosion, and the intercom went silent. Black smoke began to seep into the elevator. No one's cell phone worked. The ceiling hatch was welded shut, so there was no escape that way. Patch and Jan began working on the car doors and propped them open with the long handle of the squeegee. Facing them was a wall stenciled with a number 50. This elevator did not serve the 50th floor because it was an express, so there was no need for an opening. It was dry wall, three layers of it fastened together with steel studs. It could be cut by a knife, but no one had it. Demser took the squeegee and separated the metal handle and the long blade and removed the, the rubber from the blade and began picking at the, at the dry wall. He slid its metal edge over the wall over and over again. And Patch and others took turns after kicking, kicking it, did little good. Carving into the third layer of the sheetrock, Demser's hands trembled and he dropped the squeegee and it fell between the door and the opening. He had one tool left, a short metal squeegee handle. They carried on, kicking the drywall with feet and gouging it with a metal handle, cutting an irregular rectangle about 18 to 20 inches. Finally, they hit a a layer of white tiles. They broke the tiles and saw a bathroom. And Al Smith, who was the smallest among them, squeezed through and went for help. They kept enlarging the hole, and one by one, men squirmed squirmed through the opening head first, always popping onto the floor. Then about 9.35, Smith returned with engine company five, firefighters who hustled them to the staircase. Reaching the 15th floor, they heard a thunderous metallic roar. The South Tower had just collapsed. It was now 9.59. 23 minutes past 10, they, they finally burst onto the street, as, and five minutes later, the North Tower collapsed. Their escape had taken 95 of 100 minutes. Shivam Iyer with said, the elevator had stopped at the 60th floor, we wouldn't have made it. One of them afterwards said, that man with the squeegee, he was like our guardian angel. Church-going Demzer, who attended a Ukrainian Orthodox church and was a Christian, knew better. He said, I'm not a hero, but just holding a squeegee, squeegee, I'm only a window washer. It wasn't the squeegee. I was praying, Lord, help us. Help us get out. I was worried about the people in danger. It was only a squeegee. By an uneducated Polish immigrant. But it was the staff of God for those six who were in that elevator. And it would have been for us if we had been there. You are a priest. You have a parish. There are no unimportant people. There are no unimportant gifts. Can you believe that God will take the gifts, the things that are in your hands, and touch them by the Spirit and bring deliverance and liberation and faith and hope and love into our complex and turbulent world? There are more things than Twin Towers on the edge of collapsing and bringing disaster to hundreds of millions. And God has already put into your hands things that you can use in the circle of your influence. 
I must confess. Now, as an 80-year-old man, as you can tell by my voice, fully retired for seven years, no longer active on a team of colleagues and partners doing what our culture considers significant, important, worthy of, the, of headlines in the newspaper. Done are the days of being a university professor, a dean, or a provost. Done are the days when I was running the MA program in 19 countries. What's left in my hands as a retired individual? Not any significant position in terms of the value scale of our culture. I don't even have decades of time ahead of me, as some of you do, which will allow you to receive new gifts and new capabilities and new competencies and new assets to use for the kingdom of God. But there are some of us that are even more limited, and they're probably listening by television. They can't be here because they're sick and infirm and seemingly permanently sidelined. But we say to them as well, what do you have that you did not receive? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of heavenly lights. Those of us who are looked on as sidelined are not in the fray of things, still have a voice. We still have time. We still have people in our lives. We can pray for others, even if we cannot go with them on a project to Habitat for Humanity or on a mission project to Africa or Asia. I want to tell you, in closing, the story of a very sick and old woman in the hospital and a young doctor at her bedside, a doctor with a PhD from Yale University in physical chemistry and an MD from University of North Carolina. Two people with very different things in their hands. And here's how the doctor talks about that encounter that he had with this woman. In the home where I grew up, faith was not something that was talked about very much. My father was a professor of drama, my mother a playwright. When I went to college and those discussions in the dorm late at night took place about religion, I found no reason to attach any value to a faith worldview. I assumed that any religious feelings that anyone held must be on the basis of some emotional experience, and I didn't trust those, or on the basis of some childhood indoctrination which I felt I was fortunate to have missed. In medical school, I loved the experience of learning about the human body and all of its complexities. I particularly loved being introduced to genetics. And then I moved on to clinical training portion, learning to take care of patients with real diseases, real people with real suffering. One afternoon, I was with one of my patients, a wonderful woman, much like a grandmother who had a very bad heart disease. She had a particularly bad episode of chest pain when I was with her. She got through it, and at the end of that, explained to me how her faith in Jesus was the thing that helped her in that situation. She realized the doctors around her weren't really able to give her much help, but her faith was. And after she finished her own personal description of that faith, she turned to me. I had been silent, and she looked at me quizzically and then asked, What do you believe, doctor? I was stunned. I said I didn't really know. Her question had made me realize that I, as an atheist, I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with. Is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. I was supposed to be a scientist. If there's one thing scientists claim they do, it is to arrive at conclusions based on evidence. And I hadn't taken the trouble to do that, so I was determined to search for evidence. I was greatly assisted by a pastor who lived down the road, who tolerated my blasphemous questions and gave me a copy of C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. Here was an Oxford scholar, a prodigiously developed intellect who had traveled on the same path. Within, within those pages, I realized for the first time that one can come to belief on a rational basis. In fact, I soon discovered that there are many pointers towards the creator that come from science itself. The universe had a beginning. It follows elegant mathematical laws, and it is fine-tuned by the way all those constants that determine the behavior of matter and energy seem to have been set just in a certain way, very precise range to make life possible. 
as I searched for the more evidence of what God must be like, I encountered the person of Jesus Christ. That day, at my patient's bedside, started a journey for me, a journey that I was reluctant to begin, but I felt I needed to. It was a journey that I thought would result in strengthening my atheism, but to my surprise, resulted in my conversion. I am now a follower of Jesus. So what did that old, heart-sick woman have in her hands? The doctor you'll recognize, perhaps already, is the famous Francis Collins, who led the Human Genome Project and more recently was head of the National Institutes of Health. All that was in the hand of that elderly woman was a deadly sickness he was treating. Time a voice and a testimony. That was all she had left. But it started Francis Collins on a journey that led to faith. God has given you potentials that are not yet unfolded or realized. He will put into your hands different kinds of staff through your lifetime. And what you need to do is to ask God to touch them by his spirit so they become the staff of God. You may feel about as useless as a concrete parachute. Unable, isolated, ungifted. Trust God. Open your hands to receive his good and perfect gifts regardless of your stage of life. No matter what is in your bank or stock accounts, no matter your health or your age, work to enlarge and sharpen your abilities. Open your hands and receive what God wants to put in them. You are a priest. You have a parish. There are no unimportant people. There are no unimportant gifts. May the staff or squeegee you hold or the ones God will put into your hands through your lifetime become the staffs of God for the blessing of the nations, for liberation of the oppressed, for the salvation and making of disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ through faith. So be it. Now let's sing and yield who we are into God's hands. <laughs>